Welcome back, healthy people, to On Call with Dr. Randy. I have one of my good medical friends with me today. We've been homies for a good minute from our early days training from fell in the pre-MCAT to deciding when to go to medical school, all that stuff. So we have Dr. Benson O'Key with us today. What's up, Benson? How's it going, man? Good to see you. It's going well. It's going well, man. It's good to see you too. So Dr. Benson is an internist. He works in internal medicine. What made you decide to go into that profession? Uh, you know, internal medicine... I think the thing that that sold me on it are the the tools that you're equipped with. You're you're, you're very versatile. Um, you feel in command of kind of the breadth of disease, and um, I think from there you can branch into and be involved in so many different things. You don't have to give up. Um, you don't have to give up a part of medicine. Really, you're always going to be a part of of all different areas. <laughs> So you decided to be an internist. What is an internist? Internal medicine, internist, we use those things kind of interchangeably, but some people may not know what exactly encompasses an internal medicine physician. Yeah, actually, it's funny because most of my patients have no idea when uh, when I tell them I'm an internal medicine physician, what it is. You get this blank look from them. They ask you, what type of doctor are you when you walk in? <laughs> you tell them internal medicine and they say, Oh, okay. And then, you know, a third of them will have the bravery to be like, what exactly is that? <laughs> so uh, for for people in the field, for doctors, in particular in the field, um, doctors are, are very aware of what their internists can do and what when to reach out to the internists. Um, but for the general public, um, internal medicine is essentially um, the use of the foundations of the science and the pathophysiology of, of the human body um, and the interplay with that and the diagnosis, the treatment, and the management of human disease, um, and then using healthcare systems to kind of deliver that treatment in a, a high value way to patients and, and to populations. So um, the thing that makes that, you know, it's important for the public to know is that internal medicine doctors specialize and focus on adult populations. We don't take care of kids. We generally don't take care in, um, of pregnant women by ourselves. Um, we can take care of pretty much every other type of patient in consultation, but the kids we never take care of and pregnant women we only take care of in consultation when they're seeing other type of doctors. So when somebody tries to send you a kid, you're like, ah, oh, hell no. Mm -mm. You need to go go see the pediatrician. Take another look at the, the, the date of birth, and we say, uh-uh. Not <laughs> like, my school. <laughs> you're like, nope, they're 17. They're not 18 yet. They got to go see the pediatrician. <laughs> so what what's a typical day for you like? Because I'm assuming you work in a hospital setting. Correct. Yes, I'm a hospitalist. So uh, for me, um, depending on the call schedule, um, anywhere between getting up at between 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. And usually at the hospital by 6.30 to 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, usually um, receive a list of patients that I'm responsible for caring for for the day. Go over events of the night, their vital signs, their lab work. Then we'll go around on those patients, um, examine them, ask them how their night went, try to get to understand more of their story, what, why they're in the hospital, how their care has been going, and then create a plan for what they need to do to get through the hospitalization and what they need to do to get home or wherever they're going to go after the hospital as, um, as efficiently as possible. Yeah. Um, after doing that, then spend a lot of time documenting and and um, executing those plans, monitoring the results of testing, and then um, at some point in the evening, call it a night. Okay. So one of the main reasons I want to bring you on is for us to kind of have an open conversation about when a person is admitted into the hospital. So 
something has to go on major to have somebody that has to be kept overnight and not feeling like they're safe to go home. So what are the, some of the common reasons that people are, are admitted into the hospital? Some of the most common reasons people come in with chest pain and we're concerned that they've got life-threatening condition related to that chest pain. Um, one of the most common presentations of the hospital that, that brings people there are passing out, which we call syncope. Um, and when there's, because there's such a high number of people that that pass out and present to the emergency department, when there's anything kind of alarming about their presentation, we keep them in the hospital and kind of check out the, the reasons. But as you can imagine, any organ system that you have could bring people to the hospital and depending on what might be going on with that um, system, they may need to be admitted from pneumonia to failing of their kidneys or a liver or some uh, mechanical or some type of infectious process in their enteric system. Um, you know, internists in particular, you, you name it, we're, we're dealing with something um, that needs to be hospitalized typically. So I always kind of like to do in these type of situations when I have people on, it's just giving them some kind of case scenario and seeing like how you progress in your type of field to getting someone admitted into the hospital. So let's just say me, I come in with pneumonia. I got a real bad cough, fever, chills. My x-ray looks like trash. The ER, I'm assuming, will call you and let you know that, hey, Dr. Randy's here. He has real bad pneumonia. Um, we think he should be admitted into the hospital. Is, is that usually how it goes for you? And if so, what's the next process after that? Right. Yeah, absolutely. That That's a typical scenario. It happens many times a day. The next step will be to determine, you know, what's the best place to take care of you? You know, is it in the hospital? Is it at home? Is it in the ICU? Um, you know, do we need to call the funeral home because you're so far gone that it's time to get you loaded up and, and shipped out? No. But we um, once we determine that the, the safest place for you is in the hospital as opposed to home and you're not in the ICU, then you would get admitted to, um, you know, a floor that maybe an internist would be taking care of you. And from there, we would try to create a plan to get you um, into the hospital and some initial testing done to figure out what's the next best thing to do to, to get you better. So what kind of goes into the decision making if someone goes into just a regular room on the floor or to the ICU? Like how far, how bad do have to, people have to be to go to the ICU? Yeah. So there's, you know, academically, there's like a set of criteria for every disease condition where you'd say this person based on this academic, you know, criteria um, requires ICU level of care. The reality of um, the healthcare system is that you basically need to put people, um, you have a limited number of resources. You need to get your sickest people um, the, 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 most um, escalated use of resources that you can get them to get them better. So in saying that resources weren't an issue and they weren't limited, then somebody that needs to go to the ICU with pneumonia is somebody who potentially needs to be, you need to mo monitor um, their ability to breathe um, safely on their own without the use of um, advanced delivery devices for, for oxygenation and ventilation. So um, if that's, you know, at some hospitals, that means anybody that requires um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which we call BiPAP for short, um, but basically masks that, that deliver pressure to make breathing easier. A lot of hospitals, they require those patients to go to the ICU. Some other hospitals may have a practice pattern where they keep those patients on the floor. If anybody needs to be or, or concerned that they might need to be on um on a ventilator or life supporting machine that does breathing for you completely and is invasive and gets plugged into your lungs. And that person would need to be in the ICU. Um, and then there's some other, um, there's some other effects that pneumonia can have on the human body. And if you see those effects severe enough, such as, um, you know, really bad sepsis, 
and somebody that's really acidotic and needs just very careful monitoring um, by nurses that have less patients and can uh, make more rapid adjustments and monitor changes in, in condition, then, um, then that patient may need to be in the ICU. So there's a number of different things um, that pneumonia could cause that would require the person to, to be in the ICU. So just looking at the patient in, in um, fatality um, and then making the determination based on the resources where you are, whether or not the ICU is the best place or, or somewhere else. So each situation is different. It's not kind of cookie cutter for you deciding where people go in the hospital. 100%, 100%. And that's one thing that, you know, um, you know, with the art of medicine and the science and um, and the, the interplay between the art of medicine, and the disease and the science of medicine, um, it's, it's definitely not cookie cutter because there's a number of different factors that would make where somebody would go make sense in one situation, but not make sense in another situation. Mm-hmm. You know, perhaps so, the family's wish not to do aggressive. The family says, regardless of what happens to my 95 year old grandmother, it's her wish and our wish that we don't do anything that would be harmful or extremely aggressive in ca- taking care of her. And so, in that situation, although that patient might meet the criteria academically to go to an ICU, you know, we may consider that maybe the best use of resources for that patient to go to a um, to a lower level of care. Um, in their situation, knowing that they wouldn't option to take more escalated, more aggressive measures for care. (laughs) So what makes you determine that someone's safe to go home in certain scenarios, as opposed to getting admitted into the hospital? Right. And really that comes down to um, looking at the patient. Cause again, regardless of how much we understand the science, you know, every disease is, is um, treated through the medium of a patient. And so for one particular patient, that may mean something a little different than the next patient. With pneumonia, for example, you watch somebody who's most likely off of oxygen, able to take the medications that they need to take to get better. And you've kind of demonstrated that you know that they're gonna improve on the medications that they're gonna go home on. Um, And they're not gonna require close monitoring from nurses um, and you don't expect them to get worse with respect to their breathing or with respect to their infection and its effects on the body if they go home. Mm-hmm. So one thing I always like to do is kind of give people a peek behind the curtain and certain things that we have to go through in medicine and certain decisions that we have to make. So for you being an internist, who makes that final call on who gets admitted into the hospital? Because I know you have to have certain conversations with you and the emergency room doctor who may call you to have the patient admitted. Like the example that I gave earlier, like, hey, they called you. They think the ER doctor thinks I need to be admitted. And you're kind of like, no, we can give him these meds and he can go home and he should be able to be stable at home. Who makes that final call for Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you you um, you you really want to be in a situation where it's a collaboration. You know, approach it as a team. Um, you want the emergency room physician, the hospital physician, and the patient, and the patient's family, to kind of be on board with what plan you come up with. You say, you know, you tell somebody, look, this is what it looks like for you. Um, we think that you can go home. You're not requiring oxygen. Um, your lab work is reassuring. We think that your exposures uh, on a day-to-day basis don't really put you at risk for some rare bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. And so we think we can safely send you home um, with antibiotics that you can pick up at your pharmacy. And we expect that, you know, you'd get better within a week and and that if you follow up with your primary care doctor, they can continue to uh, monitor you as an outpatient to get better. You know, and, and that's why there, there needs to be collaborative effort because you may be in a situation where a patient doesn't have good follow-up or a patient, you know, otherwise has nobody at home to help them. They're so weak, they can't get around, they're throwing up, they can't take their medicine. And so any one of those things, um, any number of different things could kind of make it make not make sense to send somebody home. 
Um, and, and so that's, that's, you know, ultimately kind of, I think you can, you know, a doctor can always say, okay, this is the final call, but it really doesn't make sense to, to make a decision without kind of the buy-in from everybody involved in decision making. Mm -hmm. So are you at a regular hospital or are you at a teaching hospital? Um, I am at a just a regular hospital. There's no residents at most of the hospitals I work at. Okay. So just for my listeners, uh, um, just background kind of on this question that a teaching hospital has residents, which are doctors that are still in training. And sometimes those doctors are the ones who admit you as a patient into the hospital. So I just wanted um, Benson to kind of expand on just having the conversation of how you are admitted into the hospital at a teaching hospital and how that's different from when you're admitted at a regular hospital. That's a great question because, <laughs> uh, you know, typically if um, you go to a teaching hospital, because the mission is a little bit different, they not only want to take care of you, but they also want to make sure that um, when I get older and gray and die and I'm gone, that there's other doctors after you and I to help take care of the next generation of people. And so, um, you know, you wouldn't have doctors without training centers. And so it's important. It's an important mission. And to that end, um, in our line of training is we put people in, in the game. So, you know, you might have a medical student come and talk to you first and that medical student, um, maybe just beginning to learn how to talk to a patient and what questions to ask and how to examine. And you might be surprised by some of the questions they ask because they're, they're being um, expected to be extremely thorough and vast and wide in their discovery and, ev and evaluation of a patient. Um, the residents may be a little bit more focused because they've got a better grasp on what's important to ask you when it comes to your particular presentation to the hospital. Um, and the supervising physician may be the most focused in asking you some questions because they're, you know, relying on that resident for a lot of the information and the medical student on a lot of the information that they're getting. And then also they're the most experienced at knowing exactly what bits of information they need to ask to uh, treat you the most effectively. Um, and efficiently. So in a teaching hospital, you may get tired of answering questions because you may answer the certain questions six or seven times before, before it feels like anybody's actually doing anything <laughs> for you. Um, whereas at a hospital that I work at, most likely after speaking to the intake team and then the, your, your ER nurse and then your emergency room physician, and that when they make the decision, they think you need to be admitted and I come down to see you um, and we're probably going to get rolling um, and get you started on what you need to do to get better. Um, it's going to happen quicker. Um, but of course, at a teaching hospital, there's there's a bit of a process. And I will say that that can be pretty frustrating for people at times. But at the same time, I tell you, listeners, to keep in mind that a lot of times. Um, as much as you know, the seasoned expert attending feels confident in everything that they've obtained to to um, to take care of the patient. A lot of the times, interestingly enough, those medical students that have many many hours to talk to you about all types of things can pick up on stuff that may not otherwise come up. Um, and so sometimes it's a benefit to a patient. And of course, a lot of those teaching hospitals have a larger number of um, specialists and resources uh, and sometimes are at, you know, the cutting edge of medicine and medical research and evidence-based medicine. And so while you may give up some efficiency in the process of, of seeing your team and, involved, and being involved with your team, there's sometimes there's, you know, you stand again a lot in other areas too. Right. So if you're at a teaching hospital, you may have a lot of people come in and out your room asking you questions, um, repeated questions over and over again. But sometimes it's a good aspect because you may forget something and prompted by someone else when they ask you a certain question that may help be helpful in us kind of helping to figure out what's wrong and going on with you. 
And so you kind of mentioned earlier, we had this discussion about the criteria that you kind of look at for admitting people into the hospital. Did your admitting criteria change a little bit during COVID? I mean, we're still in COVID, but when it was at the forefront and real heightened um, limited resources during that time period, did you kind of have to change your game plan and some of the things that you were doing then? You know, I'd say um, the the criteria didn't change. Uh, I wouldn't say that we looked at patients the same way and and um, and people that needed to be in the hospital, we, we still admitted them to the hospital. What changed were the systems that were in place to kind of deliver that care. So, whereas, you know, I think that's a good question to ask. Um, in the healthcare field, we want to do everything we can to take care of people. So what ended up happening, I think, in, in terms of the way um, in hospital administrators had to kind of look at the way um, hospitals were run and managed were you had to cancel some elective surgeries for a very long period of time because you needed to make more space for people to be admitted to, to be in your hospital than normally would be. Um, and so floors where you normally had people that were coming out of uh, hip replacement or knee replacement, maybe there were less um, of those beds available for what would normally exist in a hospital and um, more resources were diverted towards just having the massive influx of patients. Um, and so, whereas perhaps you, you, you had a certain level of care of patients in an ICU typically, you know, you'd run into situations where there weren't any ICU beds, not just in your hospital, but not in the next hospital or mm -hmm. in any hospital in the state. And so um, we had to kind of deliver probably ICU level care in, um, in on floors where people normally wouldn't have ICU level care just because we were acting in a um, crisis state. Um, and, you know, that usually those crisis states are short lived, but, um, we did, we did touch, you know, reach the limits of, of healthcare delivery. I think in this country, there was places, you know, there, you didn't have enough, um, you know, you can't make a nurse overnight. You can't make a doctor overnight. You can't make a, you can't build a ventilator overnight. And so when you run out of, um, resources, you have to make do with what, what you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a big strain on the healthcare system, limited availability and rooms. And speaking of rooms, let's just say I'm still in my room. You came and told me that I was getting admitted to the floor, to a regular room upstairs. It's it's the next day. You saw me on Thursday and Friday. I'm still in the emergency room and I haven't been upstairs. What is usually sometimes the delay in people getting a room on the actual floor and getting admitted into the hospital. Yeah, absolutely. So every um, room that a patient would go to in a hospital has to have a nurse that is available to take care of that patient. So, you know, you can build as much space as you want to create as many quote unquote rooms as you want to in a hospital but nurses have to take care of those patients in the hospital. Doctors have to take care of those patients in the hospital. And so um, typically when you're in an emergency room waiting for a, for a bed out of the emergency room inside the hospital, you're typically waiting for another patient to be ready to leave the hospital, to go home, for that bed to be cleaned up um, and prepared for you to come into a sanitized room and, and deliver care. So, Anything along that process that um, limits that can prevent you from being able to go from the emergency room to your room. I'll give you a funny story. One day I was at a hospital, shall remain nameless, and um, <laughs> we were admitting patients and taking care of them. And all of a sudden we noticed a huge backup in the hospital. The ER was backing up. Patients couldn't get out of the ER. The rooms weren't getting ch changed over. People weren't getting discharged. People didn't know what was going on. And we come to find out at that hospital actually there was a celebration for the um, the environmental services department, the, the janitorial services department. They were having like a, a team picnic 
and they all stopped working for a while. <laughs> and so none of the rooms were getting clean. <laughs> and because none of the rooms were getting clean, patients couldn't leave the ER to go upstairs. People couldn't. It just backed up the whole hospital. And so um, sometimes there's nursing shortages. Nurses get sick too, um, can't come into work. They can't find somebody to replace them. And so there may be a physical bed available, but there's not a staffed bed um, available, meaning there's not a nurse to care for a patient if they went to that bed. And it limits the number of patients that can be um, seen in the, in the hospital. And so that's where, you know, hospital administrators are making their um making their earning their keep because they're trying to figure out behind the scenes how to to rearrange things in the hospital so that patients can can get to the next phase of care that's crazy that they were having a picnic that just shows you the importance of environmental services um, getting people in and out um, efficiently at the hospital that's why that's why so all right, I finally get a room. I am upstairs. I am tucked in. I have my nurse who's probably also assigned to like three other patients. So I'm not going to be her favorite patient, but I am assigned to her. What should I expect uh, while I'm admitted into the hospital the first couple of days? Yes, very important question. Very, very important question. Because expectations are everything. And I think if you if you go into it with the right expectation, you won't be disappointed. Um, I think we do live in a um, sort of in a fast era where information is readily available on your phone. You a lot of times patients can look at their the results of tests on their phone and know it as soon as you walk in the room. Um, but there are some parts of the of, of the healthcare delivery system that that unfortunately um, require some level of um, care uh, to ensure safety. And so, you know, I like to think about it as getting on an airplane. When you get on an airplane, you know, someone like you, Randy, for example, you're, you're flying to, uh, to, to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico for vacation. What, you, what do you want to do? You want to get to your destination. You want to get on the plane. You want to get safely to your destination. You want to get out and enjoy your time after you get there. But once you get on that plane, there's a lot of stuff that you're not in control of anymore. And as long as you recognize that everyone working on that plane is trying to get you to your destination safely, and that's the number one goal, the most you can do is just sit back, relax, and just enjoy the ride because you really do lose a lot of control in the situation. Um, and, and in, and in the hospital, it's the same way. There's going to be, it's, there's, there's going to take, um, it's going to take quite a bit of time sometimes to get to that destination, which for a patient coming into the hospital is, is to get out safely, to get out in better health than when you came in. Um, and as long as someone has the expectation that, there's going to be some period of time where we're not in control, but what's waiting for you on the other side is a healthier life, a safer life, and a good time when you can get out of the hospital. Um, then that that expectation will help you get through it um, peacefully. Um, during that course, the doctors are figuring out what, based on testing, based on your response, your your response to treatments, um, if you're improving enough to go home. Um, they're trying to determine whether or not you can leave the hospital. And if you leave the hospital, if it's safe to go home or if you have to go to somewhere before you can get to home, like a rehabilitation facility, then what you need to do when you leave the hospital, do you need to see, you know, Dr. Hines the next day after you leave? Can you see him a week or two after you leave? And so on and so forth. I like that plane example that you gave. So I'm the passenger on the plane and essentially like you're the pilot. So you're trying to help me to get to my destination. So how should my healthy listeners, which is what I call my listeners, how do they know if they do or don't have a good pilot that's helping them direct their care? Like what should they be on the lookout for? Yeah. Um, I'd say 
what I say is most um, people. Because a lot of people and not. Because a lot of people like people of color, we have concern about making sure that we're getting the right care. We're in the hospital and sometimes we have a disdain for the health system and fi- feel like, which is true that we have some kind of um, like disdain because of things that have happened in the past. So trying to figure out, making sure the doctor is doing the right thing. Right. I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you're, if you're in somebody else's care, your life is on the line, your health is at stake. If you are concerned about someone not delivering, you know, compassionate care to you, um, then you can't, you can't be hesitant to speak up and, and ask for better if you feel like you deserve better. Um, and any doctor worth their salt won't take offense to somebody asking for a second opinion or asking for another set of eyes to, to assess a situation because, you know, as you know, the practice of medicine is also practiced in humility. You know, there's, hmm. there's not, um, there's not one doctor that knows every single thing there is to know. And a lot of the times actually doctors confer with each other about, um, things that they're not sure of. So, um, it, it doesn't, it's, it, it's not going to hurt your doctor's feelings to ask, Hey, do you mind if we get a second opinion about, uh, you know, that, you know, you let your doctor know, like, I'm really worried and nervous about making this decision. Do you, you know, do you mind if we get a second opinion on, on this before I, I make a, make the decision to, to follow that treatment plan. And I think that, you know, every doctor is going to find somebody else that can, can help to weigh in from their perspective. And I think, you know, every doctor is going to look at um, every single case and situation and decision with the way they're trained to, which is to analyze and think about what's the best thing for that patient. So um, the thing is to advocate for yourself. The other thing is I'd say is, is when you're in a hospital, sometimes because of the illness, it's hard to have all your wits about you. Um, and so enlisting people to, um, to help advocate for you and to help keep um, information and data for you. You know, if you have surgery, you get anesthesia, you're not going to remember, um, you're not going to remember necessarily what the doctor's telling you after. Have somebody else with you, whether it's a friend, you know, somebody in the medical field that knows which questions to ask and which things to look out for, or just anybody that cares about you, have them listen in when the doctor comes in, have them try to help remember what the doctor's saying so that, so that you can, you know, play back with somebody else. What, what did they tell me about uh, what we were going to do about my blood pressure? And, you know, just try to help, I'd say, personalize yourself. You know, I think um, when people go to the hospital, it's some, a lot of times it's the most important days of their life. You know, it's the most important 24 hour, most important one week of their life having been in a hospital. And for a lot of people that work in the health field, um, that's, that's a job they go to every single day. And so, um, there's in a lot of ways, there's a big discrepancy between kind of, uh, just, just that simple fact. And so if you can, I think if you can remind your, your care team, you know, why, um, why this getting healthy and getting to your destination is important to you, you might remind them, you know, the importance of what they're doing and why they need to make sure they, they help you get to that destination safely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like what you talk about as far as family members being advocates, if possible. Do you have any types of tips or information that you wish family members would know before their uh, family member is admitted into the hospital, such as things about how to get in contact with the doctor if they have a question or things they should bring to help you out? from home to help you out in the assessment, what things should family members know? Yeah. So amazing question. So when we try to figure out what's going on with someone and, um, and what to do for them, even though we've got, um, decades and decades and centuries and centuries of medical research and training and education, um, and experience, 
still, I think the estimate is about 75% of what we do in diagnosing what's going on with someone is based on the history that they tell us. So most of us figuring out what's going on with somebody is based on the information that they can give us about what's going on. So sometimes before you get to the hospital, before you see a doctor, try to um, recreate a timeline of events that led up to to what brought you there that day. And um, sometimes when you walk in and the doctor asks you a question, sometimes it's hard to remember certain things. It's like someone puts you on the spot and you can't remember. And as soon as they walk out, then you can remember some information. But sometimes if you can practice that in your head and just think about why exactly did we show up here and what was going on beforehand, um, the who, what, where, when, and why, um, it'll help you help answer a lot of the questions they're going to have. The next thing I'll say is, is try to remember um, kind of any other medical treatment or interventions that happened before you went to the hospital. Have you ever had surgeries? Do you have any allergies? Um, you know, what medications do you take at home? Were you just at another hospital two days ago? <laughs> you know, try to remember those those things. If you have a list of medications, it's extremely helpful. If you know the names or the places where you get care, usually that's extremely helpful. If you know the pharmacy that you get your medications at, that's extremely helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And that contributes a lot in terms of getting the best care you can get. Remember, your, your doctor and your nurse want you to have a good outcome. Because not only is it um, in your interest for you to have a good outcome, it's also in the interest of your doctor, it's, a, it's, it's a, in the uh, best interest of the nurses caring for you, the hospital caring for you, that you have the best outcomes you can have. And if you see your role in, as a patient and a family or as an advocate as just getting the team all the necessary tools so they can in turn reflect back and give you the best outcome, um, I think if you look at it, that partnership that that um, as like a team effort, then working collaboratively with that that team, you'll probably get the best outcomes you can get for you and get to your destination as safely as possible. Yeah. Another thing that people should know is who's the doctor that's primarily taking care of your family member as well the entire time there, because sometimes it may switch from week to week, right? Benson may be there this week, but your family member is staying three weeks and then Benson's off next week. And so it's another doctor who's taking care. And then also um, you may have a question, but we're not there the entire day. We, we, we have to go home. So it might be a nighttime doctor who just may have like a little quick summary of what's been going on, but may not have all the information. And so it's probably best to have a conversation with us as physicians earlier in the morning about what's going on and the game plan too, as well. Yeah. And another thing that, you know, for extra credit, um, you can even as a family member or a friend, uh, if that patient has a good relationship with their outpatient provider and that outpatient provider's office, a lot of times they can facilitate getting very relevant information to a disease that's been treated in the clinic before they present to the hospital. And that information can be um, extremely critical in determining what's the best thing to do. You know, somebody's, you know, kidney function could look like it's stable and great, but, you know, relevant information from their primary care doctor can let you know that actually their kidney function is half as good as it was a week ago. And, and that may have a big impact on what you decide to do for that person in the hospital. So, um, you know, partnering with your, your primary care doctor, make sure you, you know, that goes into, uh, you know, that uh, opens up a whole other discussion, but making you share a relationship with your primary care doctor um, and you see them regularly when you, when they want you to see them um, is going to go a long way in, determining how well you do in the hospital. And that's an investment in time and effort that may start years back before you even ever have to end up in the hospital. All right. So come see me. So you won't be all out of whack in case you have to get admitted into the hospital and something worse happens to you because you didn't get your annual physical. So you finally got me somewhat stable now. 
what determines that I'm able to go home? Well, usually we have, depending on what you're coming for, we usually have certain milestones um, that we're looking for that says, okay, you're ready to go home. So um, typically we want you to be able to eat and drink. We want you to be able to take the medicine that you need to take at home. We need you to be able to participate and do your activities of daily living when you go home. So you need to be able to typically um, bathe yourself. You need to be able to prepare yourself some food. If you can't do those things, then you have somebody that can help you do those things for yourself. Um, you may need to be able to go get food, to bring it home, to prepare it. You may be able to, to take care of your finances. Um, so we want to know that you're able to um, participate in your activities of daily living. And um, if you can't, then you may need a different level of care when you leave the hospital. But then also, we need to know that whatever disease condition you had that brought you in the hospital is stabilized. It's 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 getting better, um, or it's stable and it's improving, and it's not going to cause irreversible harm to you if you leave the hospital setting. Um, and we need to know that you've got access to to get the things you need to continue to get better when you leave the hospital. So it doesn't help for us to know what you have and know what you need. And then um, there's no way that you can get those things. Um, we want to create what we call a safe plan for, for discharge. Um, so we need to have a reasonable expectation that based on the plan that we're, we're sending you home with, that, um, that you're going to continue to improve. All right. We want you to be able to go home and be safe and not have to return back to the hospital after we just discharge you from the hospital. What can be some of the pitfalls on me staying too long in the hospital? Like hospital acquired infections, me catching a blood clot. What happens when me as a patient, I stay over longer than I should? Absolutely. You know, some of the biggest ones on the head, you know, you're every day that you're at the hospital, you're at risk for, unfortunately, um, medical errors and hospital harms, infections. Um, the risk of inadvertently getting the wrong medication in the hospital, uh, the, the risk of contracting not just an infection from um, from you in the hospital, for, but from infections from the environment in the hospital or infections from other patients in the hospital. Um, the um, Just the, the simple act of being laying down in the bed and not being able to get up and move around a lot can lead to uh, decompensation physically, which can put you at risk for, for other things, other medical conditions. And then even um, particularly in older patients, the longer you're in the hospital, um, you know, there's a significant risk for getting extremely delirious for being in the hospital. And um, delirium can be something that has impacts that last for an extremely long period of time, even after you're released from the hospital. So, um, you know, being in the hospital, Longer than we, we think that being in a hospital when you're sick is and and the doctor thinks that you need to be in the hospital is the best thing that you can do for your health. But the moment that you no longer require the care of being in the hospital and that you're safe to be home, then we think that, you know, days, any day after that period of time would just increase your harm um, and are more risky than they are beneficial to you. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten this question a couple of times from some of my friends. So hospital transfers, sometimes family members don't agree with the plan of care that's going on somewhere, or their family member may be at a rural hospital or a smaller hospital, and they want them to go to a larger hospital with more resources. What's involved in transporting a patient from one hospital to another hospital? Yeah, so that is a um, that is a loaded uh, scenario and situation, and I'll say that because there are a number of different factors that are involved there, and um, every decision that we make in healthcare, we 
consider what the potential benefits of those decisions and what the potential risks are of those decisions. And, and for some people, um, transferring to another hospital is probably more risky. Just the act of transferring and being in an ambulance um, with the chance of getting sicker in the ambulance is, is, is riskier than it's beneficial. And so, um, you know, sometimes a doctor wouldn't advise a transfer if they don't think there's any benefit to going to another hospital or setting. Now, in the case that somebody wants to go just because they don't like that hospital, well, um, that hospital will most likely meet, make their request to another hospital to accept you. And under certain conditions, that hospital may be obligated to accept you and transfer. But um, in, in, on, in different scenarios, that hospital is not necessarily obligated to you. Now, there's a, there is a federal law that encompasses um, kind of that request and, and the, the short version acronym for that job, that um, law is the EMTALA law. And that's the, basically an emergency um, medical um, transfer law. And it kind of encompasses when hospitals are obligated to take patients and transfers from other hospitals. and. You know, if an emergency medical condition exists and a family is requesting transfer to another hospital, then that hospital is typically obligated to accept the patient and transfer. So as though they feel like there's, um, they have the resources to care for that patient and their hospital isn't full. Um, you know, we've noticed a lot of times in the COVID and post COVID area that a lot of hospitals because of the changes in staffing and the shortages of beds and, and resources, a lot of hospitals these days are now um, reverting back to that, that segment of the law that says they're not obligated to take patients because they don't have the adequate resources to care for people. That's something I notice has changed kind of in the post COVID era. Um, so it's something that, you know, a, a patient is, you know, has the, the right to ask hospitals, under the law typically have an obligation to, um, to hear and honor and actually evaluate and potentially accept. And um, it's not something that medical providers and hospitals take lightly because there are laws that govern that and potentially heavy fines for, for hospitals that don't uh, follow those rules and laws. Yeah, it's not that easy to make those transfers happen. You have to call them and give them the whole spiel of what's going on and they have to accept. Uh, nobody wants to take an unstable patient. Like you don't want somebody to come to your hospital and, and die as soon as they get there. And we don't want you to die during transfer, meaning from you riding in the EMS, uh, the ambulance from one hospital to another or catching a helicopter from one hospital to another. We have to make sure you're stable for that whole transfer process. So it's not that easy of just like, hey, I'm gonna call you up at Grady. Hey, Benson, I got somebody for you. Can you take, me? yeah, just send them over. Like, no, 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 it's it's a lot more that goes into that. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm stable now, I get to go home. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm breathing well, I have no fevers. I have no chills. I'm going to follow up with my PCP. Thank you so much for taking good care of me. What lasting words of wisdom will you leave for people on this episode about getting admitted into the hospital? I'm going to tell you to be your own advocate. I'm going to tell you to, you know, help your teammate out. That's, that's your medical team. Give them the assist, do everything you can to, uh, Put them in the best position to, to help you get better. Try to work as a team with them. And then I'm going to tell you, you know, invest in your health early so that, you know, we're not trying to, um, we're not trying to create something out of nothing. Connect with your primary care doctors on the outside. Make sure that your health is, has been evaluated regularly. And it's going to make your outcomes way better when you get to the hospital, if you ever need us. Great. That's some good information. So as always, I like to end with Randy's random questions. So I got two questions for you as we wrap up. You ready? Yeah. So question number one, 
after Duke, why is North Carolina the second best basketball program in the nation? <laughs> I think North Carolina has the most number of NCAA uh, wins. They've got the most successful basketball program over the longest period of time. But Duke has a great uh, athletic history um, to be proud of as well. Um, but it's a fun rivalry, that's for certain. How great was it for you to beat them last year in Coach K's uh, last game and in the tournament? Uh, one of the greatest days of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, man, probably right after your wedding that I went to. It was a great wedding, good, great wedding that I went to. Absolutely, absolutely. And last question. So if you had to leave um, one message for your little ones and for your wife, what message would that be? I love you guys. Um, you know, continue to charm the world like you all do. The world is your oyster. Make what you want of it, and uh, I'm always here for y'all. Oh, uh, you're gonna make me shed a tear, uh, so emotional. <laughs> but we'll let you off the hot seat. I appreciate you being on, I appreciate you sharing some good information. We've been knowing each other for a good minute, so it's good to see us come like full circle, kind of doing this. Um, been rocking together since what, like 2004, Duke, and doing early training there, just trying to get on the road to becoming physicians. And I'm glad we both made it through. Absolutely. But I have a question for you. Okay. I'm listening. So when you invite me down to the A, man. Hey man, the door is always open. I got a guest room over here. So you want to come through, we go to some of the old spots. I got you. Thank you up on that, man. You have a good night. All right. You too, bro. <laughs>